So welcome back. We spent last time talking about all the hard mathematical uh, algorithmic ideas underlying Barnes, Hutt, and Fast Multipole. And I'm going to today talk about how to parallelize them and some related algorithms. But this would be a great time to ask any questions uh, if there is any if you have any about how those algorithms work, because I'm going to assume at a high level we know how they work. I don't care about the details of the inside, but that we have certain quad trees, oct trees we have to build, and tree traversals that we have to do, and stuff like that. So we can just uh, so ask questions when they arise. So they all have the same structure, as I was just saying. We're going to build a quad tree. Let me just keep it in two dimensions to keep the picture simple. Then we're going to traverse it from the leaves to the root, and build what are called outer expansions. And that simply means for each uh, node in the tree, which represents a square, we take all the particles inside of it, and we want the center of mass and the total mass. That's for Barnes Hutt. And for fast multiple, that's the first term of a Taylor expansion. We compute whatever we need. And then we, we, we traverse the quad tree again from top to bottom, and we build what are called inner expansions. So an outer expansion tells you if you're far away from a bunch of guys inside a box, uh, how to approximate it. And the inner expansion says, if you're inside a box, what's the potential in you, for you due to everybody far away? So they're sort of the opposite of one another. We need both, and it's the second one that we really need, because inside each box, for each particle, we want to evaluate very cheaply the force on all those particles due to everybody that's far away. And that will work for everybody except your nearest neighbors, the particles that are in your uh, adjacent boxes. And for those, we'll just use the direct method, because they're too close to approximate. And that's the last step. So the question is, how do we parallelize all that? And there's going to be one sort of overall parallelization scheme that works for all of them. There's going to be lots of variations in tuning parameters and so forth. But there's sort of one big idea. And in fact, um, there was a PhD thesis here which built an auto-tuner, which had all of these sort of high-level ideas into it, and tried a lot of different ways of parallelizing these different n-body codes. And it was called p-body for parallel n-body. And so the first thing we have to do, of course, is divide up the work, do some load balancing. So we have to, and we're going to do that by assigning regions of space to each processor. Each processor will be responsible for the particles inside that piece of space in some load balanced way. There are several ways to do that I'll talk about. And, um, and so, but roughly everybody's going to have about one piece of the, of the particles. And so then each processor is going to store part of the quad tree. And it's going to do, do it a little bit redundantly. It's certainly going to store the leaves of the quad tree for all of the particles it owns. But it's also going to replicate the quad tree up to the root. Because it needs to get, traverse that quad tree a whole bunch of times. And it doesn't want to have to keep talking to its neighbors every time it goes up and down a tree. So the ancestors in the tree are going to get replicated everywhere. We'll do that once. It costs a little bit more memory, but it'll eliminate a lot of communication later. And then what we also want to do is, since we want to keep traversing that tree to evaluate forces, is we're going to store uh, not just all your ancestors, but a few cousins that are nearby for your neighboring processors, because we're going to be talking to them a lot to sort of get their expansions to evaluate inside. And we're going to call that the locally essential tree. So if you're a processor, your locally essential tree is everything you need from your neighbors so you can do all your work without ever talking to them again. And so we need some way to figure out what you have to grab from all your neighbors. And that'll be the locally essential tree. And then when we get all that, um, it'll be all totally parallel afterwards. So let's start with how do we assign regions of space to processors. And there are going to be two schemes. And the first one looks very much like uh, quad trees, uh, except I'm not going to divide things evenly in space. I'm going to divide them evenly in numbers. And so this, this is an old idea. It goes back to the, uh, this original paper. And so first, I will suppose everybody lives inside this black box. I'll make my first dividing line, the blue line. I'm going to choose it anywhere from left to right so that half the particles are on the right, half are on the left. Then I'll look at this half of the particles, and I'll divide it by the next horizontal, by this red line. And I'll move the red line up and down until half are above and half are below. And over here, I may put the red line in a different place. Still, the idea is half the particles are above the red line and half are below that are in this half. And I just keep repeating that recursively so that when I'm done, I think that I have 16 boxes here. And each, part, and each box will have about 1 16th of the processors inside of it. And it's the same data structure. They're just going to have slightly different boundaries. And when people did this experimentally and just tried to see how well it worked, it was reasonable in two dimensions. But it didn't work so well in three dimensions. That was an empirical observation. It just didn't balance the load sufficiently well. And so 
what uh, folks did is they went back and they looked instead at the tree itself and they asked, can we divide up the tree in a different way? And so this second scheme was called cost zones. And this was uh, uh, in 1993. And that was this shared memory version. And they also called it a hashed oct tree for the distributed memory version. So, and we're just going to use the name cost zones for both. And so what we're going to do is instead of partitioning space, we're going to build the quad tree, and we're going to partition the quad tree instead. So suppose that this is my quad tree, and let's just suppose that uh, all the leaves are at the same level. If it's not uniformly distributed, or it's, if it's very irregularly distributed, this won't be the case. But just for this picture, let me assume that I'm going to build a quad tree, and I go down four levels. And, so what I'm, and, let, and here are the leaves, and they're going to be ordered from left to right in some order. And all I'm going to do is march through the leaves from left to right, and suppose I have four processors, and they're colored, you know, magenta, green, brown, and, and pink. And I'll keep moving sideways until I have enough leaves that a quarter of the processors are in these leaves. I'll assign them to the first processor. Then I'll start counting again, and as, as soon as I get the next quarter of the pro particles, next quarter of the particles, I'll assign them to the next processor. Here are the next quarter of the particles, and here's the last quarter of the particles. So now I've done the assignment, and if I've done it right, I've also gotten my goal, which is that they're close together in space. I mean, the reason I did it this way is that these particles are close together, and since they're close, they have to communicate a lot, and so I want to assign them to the same processor. This does the same thing, just slightly differently. So there's a certain ordering here, which I've presumed as I number the leaves from left to right, and here you can sort of see the coloring, and we had a name for this ordering, we've seen it before, when we did... Uh, matrices, when we did linear algebra, we had to ask, how do I take my matrix? And this kind of looks like a matrix, even though it's just space. And we had to figure out how to divide it up and, and, and assign it to different processors so that things were contiguous. What did we use? We used space filling curves. And so this is exactly the same idea. And so in this case, I'm using a particular space filling curve, which we called Morton ordering, uh, and it's in the shape of a C. So first I take this block, then that block, then that block, then that block. So it's sort of a, a backward C. So these get assigned first, and then I start over here in this block, and then inside here I do the same thing. So it's this recursive backward C, and so th that's the order of all these little blocks from left to right. And then, then this guy is the last one there, and then I keep going that way, and then I go that way, and then I get to the top of the C, and that's how the ordering goes. And it isn't perfectly uh, adjacent. For example, this brown box is not absolutely, you know, it's not completely adjacent to these other brown boxes, but space filling curves are about as good as you can do, and so that's a perfectly reasonable way to do it. So the question is, how do we build this data structure and number things correctly? <coughs> and so here's where, why they're called hashed octrees in the original uh, paper. So what we're going to do is assign a unique key to each box, sort of an index, and then just, which is roughly corresponds to its xy coordinates in some interesting interleaf fashion. And I'll just take the bits from those interleaved xy coordinates and use those for my, my hash function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign the root. There's only one root. I'll call it number one. And then the root is going to have four children. And so the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to number the x coordinates are going to be, this is zero, one, very simple x coordinates. The y coordinates are going to be zero, one. And I'm just going to interleave them. So this bit here, that, that bit is a zero, and that bit is a, is a one, because the x goes from zero to one. And that's a zero, and that's a one, the middle bits. And the y's go from zero to one, and zero to one. And so when I've interleaved them, the order is zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And so that's a different space filling curve. It, it looks like an n. That's called n Morton ordering. And, so, and then I do it another layer. So if I go to another layer, I need two more bits to go, do x, y, and I get, you know, four more little n's in there. So the question is, suppose I've, so that's going to be how I implicitly number everything. And so the question is, how do I assi assign these boxes now with these numbers to processors uh, using a hash function? So here I've just drawn the picture again, so the same pictures I had before with the interleaved x and y coordinates. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bottom bits of, of this number, of this index, and use that to pick a processor. And so, um, let's suppose I have four processors, so I'll pick the bottom two bits to look at and figure, to figure out who to go, where to go. And so, the first ones I get are these. And if I look at this, um, the bottom bits of the key, so I look at, <coughs> so 
So I'm not sure. Let's see. I'm doing ends. Yes. So it goes this order. Um, sorry, I start up here. Let me get this right. Yes. I do this order. So these are the orders. So these ones come first. And then I come, uh, come up here. That one's at the end of that end. Then I come up to this part and I, do, I grab those. Then comes this guy. Then comes this guy. He's the beginning of the last end. And finally, I get the whole last end. And I do that just by using, as a hash, the, the bottom bits of, of my hash function. So it's a very simple way to do it, and that makes sure that everybody gets assigned contiguously. OK. So, the question, so, that, so that's the basic idea. The question is, how do I implement it in parallel in an efficient way? And, and so the whole point here is to build the quad tree. And so we have this chicken and egg problem. Um, what I want to do is avoid, I want to get, the, I want to do this fast. I want it to be load balanced. So it's not very practical to build a quad tree in order to compute the cost zones to go back and figure out how to build the quad tree and, and redistribute it everywhere, right? It's too much work to do the first part. And so what I'd like to do is figure out what, let me, sorry, go back, figure out what this looks like so I can tell the particles where to go without having to touch all the particles. I want an approximation of this. And so the idea is going to be very simple. It's going to be random sampling. Each particle is going to pick a few of its particles and send them to processor one. And hopefully, that will give me an approximation of the global distribution of particles. And then processor one is going to build, with much less work because it's a small random sample, it's going to build this quad tree and decide that the particles here, here, and here go to processor zero. The particles that are green go to the green processor and so forth. And it's going to, t it's going to take its information and it's going to send them to all the processors. And then all the processors will know exactly where they have to send their particles. And there's going to be one commu communication step where the particles go from where they're initially stored to their final destinations in the quad tree and the on the processors that they belong in. And it's going to be done with this approximate quad tree that was computed once sequentially using a small subset of all the particles. And so then that's a good thing because all the processors eventually have to know what all the distributions are because they're going to have to talk to their neighbors to get their their locally essential trees, the information that they need. So they do want to know all of this information. It's just too expensive to build the perfect quad tree and then reorganize it. So we're going to use this approximation with a subset. OK, so that's the first part of the algorithm. We've now built a quad tree. And, and the reason I'm worried about making this part of it run fast is as the particles move, I'm going to have to do the load balancing periodically again, right? Because they're not all going to stay where they started. And as they shift, I'm going to have to rebuild the quad tree. So I'd like it to be reasonably fast, but you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be the bottleneck if I do it this way. OK, so now we come down to the locally essential tree part. And that's where, as I said, each processor has to own not just all the expansions for the stuff that it owns. It needs some information from its neighbors. And it needs you know, even less information from its more distant neighbors. It needs a small subset of the tree. And then it's going to get all that information. And then it can evaluate all the forces locally without ever talking to anybody else again. And so the question is, how do I figure out which subset of this tree of all those expansions do I need to collect to put on my processor? And that's called the locally essential tree. And historically, people tried two different ways of doing it. There was a shared memory. People did it in shared memory first. And they had one way of doing it that way. And then they did it in distributed memory. And the shared memory was was the easiest way to do it first. And it was what's called receiver driven. So each processor said, well, I know the shape of the, of the quad tree. Here's who I need. I'm just going to go in, into shared memory. And I know how to access everything because I have the global structure. And I will simply grab everything, and, and it'll be in my cache. I just touch it, and it automatically comes into my cache. And, and that was a very natural thing to do. There's no explicit message passing. That's why people like shared memory. But the problem was that when people ran this, it seemed like the more processors you added, the total amount of memory, the local cache that you needed to have, grew proportional to the number of processors, because you had to sort of touch everybody else a little bit, and it didn't scale. And so, the, so when people went to distributed memory, they decided to do it differently. And it was called sender-driven instead of receiver-driven. So that means what each processor does, each processor is going to send the subset of its tree to its neighbors, that whatever the neighbors need. So to its immediate neighbors, it'll send more data. To the more distant neighbors, it'll send you know, only a small subset because it doesn't need such, so much information far away. And so we need to compute, you know, if, you're, if I own something and you're far away, how much do I have to send you? And so I, I need to tell you a little algorithm that will figure out what part of that subset of, the, of my locally stored tree to send. 
and there are two ways to do it, depending on whether it's Barnes Hut or Fast Multipole. And both of them just sort of mimic the construction of the algorithm that I gave before, the rules for deciding you know, which box was far enough away that I could use it approximately. So let me just, let me just repeat that. For Barnes Hut, it, it's actually more complicated for Barnes Hut than for fast multipole. So let's suppose I have two processors in the Barnes Hut algorithm, and N is a node, a, you know, a little square in the, in the quad tree that's, owned on, that's on processor J, and processor J has to ask itself, do I need to send that to processor K? So do I need to send that piece of information? So what's the rule for Barnes Hut? What you do is you look at your, your node, your square, and you ask, you know, what's the length of a side? That's capital D. That tells you how big the square is. Then you ask, how far away is the other guy? How far away is processor K? And, and you know, to the, the, the closest particle on processor K that it owns. And the question is, can I send, should I send this box, this summary, the, the mass and total mass of this node, off to processor K? if it's this far away. And the rule was, what you do is you take the size of the box and you divide by how far away the user is. If that's less than a threshold, they can use it. And if it's bigger than the threshold, they can't use it. But there are two rules now. The first rule says that you're, you are, this box that I own, node n, is small enough that my neighbor can use it. But he can't use my parent. Right? I am the biggest box that I own that he could possibly use, so I will send it to him. So. I'm, this node is small enough, but my parent is not. I will also send all my ancestors. So this first rule says that I'm the first guy that's small enough to be used, but I also have to send all my ancestors because those are going to be traversed by my neighbor too. So it's sort of this simple tree traversal, and now I apply this rule to figure out what to send. And for fast multipole, it's even a little bit easier. All it depends is on you know, who are your cousins once removed, so to speak, in the tree. And I, I drew this picture before, so let me just remind you of it. So here's the picture that described what information this node needs. And, and there were sort of, if you're far enough away, you get a big box that's red. And if you're, close, if you're closer, but you're not immediate neighbors, then that's the interaction set. And it was just purely defined by you know, the, the shape of the tree. In that case, node n needs to send its information to everybody labeled little i and to everybody labeled you know, big red. That's how it works. So now, that, those are all the schemes for parallelization. And there's a lot of variations on them and a lot of parameters to choose. So now I want to show you some performance data where people have you know, tried this over time. And I'm going to start with a, a very old Gordon Bell Prize and then move my way up to more modern ones. And so here is a, uh, the first time people worked on this. So this won the uh, Gordon Bell Prize for the biggest Harrius simulation back in a long time ago, 1992, when people were doing this. So this was on an enormous 512 processor Intel Touchstone Delta machine, which was the biggest machine back then. And it was uh, 8 million particles. Uh, and and uh, let's st I'll give you the data first for, for when they're uniformly distributed. That's the easiest case, when the tree is nice and uniform. And they were only shooting for like 1% error or 0.1% error, because that's all you could get from Barnes Hut. So this, uh, this, you know, so this predated fast multipole. And so it ran in 114 seconds which gave them a, a big old 5.8 gigaflops, which I'm sure your laptop can do. And so the question is, where did that time go? And, and uh, is this good? I mean, so, let's, so I'm going to show you the data, and then we're, we'll ask ourselves, how close to peak are they? By just sort of doing a, a little mental model. So first of all, you had to decompose the domain. That's where you, everybody sent a summary of their particles to, the, to you know, processor one, and that processor one built the, the, the quad tree. That took seven seconds. Then you had to build the overall quad tree. Processor 1 sent the summary to everybody, and everybody shifted their particles around to their ultimate destinations. That was another seven seconds. Then there was the first tree traversal, and that was to build all the outer expansions. And so that's a mixture of some arithmetic. You know, you're adding up the, you know, you're computing your mass and your center of mass and total mass from your children. And you're, so you have to communicate. And that took 33 seconds. And in fact, uh, most of that was the arithmetic part. There were only six seconds of communication during that, and the other 27 seconds was computing the mass and center of mass. And finally, we get to the sort of main part, which is a force evaluation. So that's where everybody's traversing the tree and you know, computing the force in each particle. And it was a little bit load imbalanced, um, but it wasn't too bad. So the, the processor who finished last finished seven seconds after the processor who finished first. That's what the load imbalance means. And so the question is, Given these numbers here, 
how would you, you know, without doing much work, decide how close you are to peak? So what sort of just sort of back of the envelope kind of you know, sanity check would you look at this data and say, you know, I'm not doing too bad? So what you could do is say, let's suppose that I only want, I mean, you have to evaluate the forces. That's sort of a given. And let's suppose everything else were free. Right, and I spent, communication were free, building all those data structures. Let's suppose I spent all my time evaluating forces. And so I would only, that would only take me 54 seconds. But actually it's a little bit better because I had this load imbalance. So let's suppose I had perfect load balance too. And so, and let's, so I'd run in 54 minus seven or 47 seconds. So it's pretty clear from this data that you know, probably 47 seconds is a really hard lower bound. And instead, it took me 114, so I'm within a factor of like two and a half of, of doing as, as well as I could. So I mean, there's still some room for improvement maybe, but I'm not a ridiculous distance away from some sort of peak. So this is kind of a back of the envelope thing that you should do on your homework and your projects too, to ask yourself if, you know, how much room for improvement in there. And the answer is there's a factor of two and a half maybe in room for improvement. You know, assuming I've done good you know, SIMD kind of local optimizations for my forces and stuff. So, um, so the other thing is, this was all the uniformly distributed case. How much worse does it get when it becomes non-uniform and it goes up to 160? And I think in this case, they put all the particles on the surface of a sphere, or some two-dimensional set like that. And so it got worse, but it didn't get dramatically worse from 114 to 160. So let me, uh, so that's the, in how to interpret this data. Let me try the next set of data and sort of see what lessons we can draw from it. So this is from David Blackston's PhD thesis, where he had built an uh, auto-tuner to try a bunch of different optimizations. And now I'm and he was going for four digits of accuracy as opposed to one or two, so he wanted a little bit more. And uh, in general, he got up to 80% efficiency on 32 processors, but I'm just going to show you the data on four and try to you know, understand what it means. And so he tried 50,000 particles on both one processor and four processors, and he tried it with both a uniform distribution, so they were all kind of scattered randomly in space, and then a non-uniform distribution. In this case, they were sitting on the surface of an ellipse, so a two-dimensional surface. So it, 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 it will you know, st stretch the algorithm a bit more. And so here are, here's the data on one processor, here's the data on four. The tree size was the same, it built the same tree in both cases. The, so the depth of the tree was the same. Here's the time that it spent, and there's the speed up. So on four processors, he got a speed up of 4.4. And here on four processors in the non-uniform case, he got a speed up of 6.1. So does that pass the sanity test? Is, can we explain why that's maybe reasonable that you go 4.4 times faster on four processors? Is there a yeah, uh, microphone? I guess one hunch that I would. Is, that, is it on? Yeah. OK. One hunch that I would have is that the uh, four processor case, if the memory hierarchy is pretty distributed over the four processors, maybe it fits in the cache Yes. after you do that. Yes, so when, when I'm running on four processors, I also have four times as much cache. That's, that's absolutely correct. And so it's not only the processing resources that go up, it's the cache, and so it's, it's quite feasible that I could spend much less time communicating and get uh, this much speed up. So maybe even more important is how much faster I am than the than the n squared algorithm, which was why this stuff was invented. And there's a factor of 50 there and a factor of 500 there in the speed up, which is the real speed up that we care about. But obviously, we want these speed ups to be good too. OK. Um, so now, let me go on to the most recent implementation for which I have data, which was a uh, 2010 paper at IPDPS, which was presented by um, a faculty member at Georgia Tech, who's a former graduate student from, from our group here. And so this explored an even bigger design space of possible implementations. He tried a whole bunch of different methods on a whole bunch of different platforms, uh, including GPUs and, and multi-core, and, 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 and a lot of auto-tuning as well. So let me just sort of, at a high level, describe the tuning space that he looked at for this one. So this was the first time people had tried comparing different implementations um, of the fast multipole method across a bunch of different processors, and they're processors we've seen before. So he tried different data structures, because there's a lot of ways to structure the data. 
different SIMD instructions, because different data structures let you use different SIMD instructions. But also there's a new SIMD instruction that you haven't used yet yourself in your homework uh, that's specific for this particular operation that I'll tell you about that he got a big benefit out of. And then there's different ways of doing multi-threading. Since he's only looking for uh, four digits of precision, there's no reason to run the whole thing in 64-bit uh, precision. You don't even have to run it in 32-bit. There are even lower precision operations on these platforms, and if you, which you can't use everywhere, but if you use them in the right places, it can go a lot faster, and I'll show you that. Uh, and then, of course, there's, there's lots of parameters to choose. So here are just sort of the high-level results, and I'll, I'll break it down in the next few slides. So on an Intel Nehalem, which is 16 threads, he got a 25x speed up. So there's another super linear speed up by doing all these things. Now, part of that is not just because of the memory, it's because of all these other things that went on. So this speed up is re with respect to a naive implementation. And here, this is an AMD Barcelona. We had the same kind of platform I showed you sparse matrix vector multiply speed ups on before. And there it's 9.4 speed up on 8. And here is at Sun Victoria Falls. That was that chip multi-threaded uh, platform that generates lots of hardware threads automatically for you. And there it was 37x speed up on, on 128 threads. So it couldn't quite keep them all busy, but it did a reasonable job. And the other thing was he also tried it on GPUs. I'll have that on later slides. And it didn't actually help very much to use GPUs. So it turns out that these algorithms, especially the tree traversal parts, are sufficiently irregular no speed up was possible on a GPU. For, yeah, and, and your experience with GPUs may explain why that could be. So in fact, the implementation on a GPU did a lot of the irregular stuff, the data structure building, the tree traversals on the uh, attached multi-core chip. And only for the force evaluations was that done on the GPU. And so even when all that was done, there wasn't, and they did as well as they could. They couldn't uh, you know, beat the, uh, the multi-core doing everything particularly. So, the other thing that they did that's new, that was invented after the beginning of the fast multipole method, is something called the kernel independent fast multipole method. So it turns out all of that stuff I showed you, it was for about gravity electrostatics, it actually works much more generally. You, it'll work for pretty much any potential that gets simpler the farther away you get. And there's a lot of things besides 1 over r squared that, you know, that fit that category. And it turns out that it, you don't need to know the mathematics of, in order to do a Taylor expansion. It'll figure it out for you automatically. All you need to get this stuff to work is a subroutine which says, you know, given two points, uh, you know, a source in, a, in, a, in, in another location, what's the potential at this location due to a particle at this point? And it can be any function you like as long as it sort of gets simpler and smoother the farther away you get. So it'll certainly work for inverse square laws. You can even have a modified Laplace kind of operator where it gets a little bit more complicated. For Stokes flow, so for fluid mechanics, there's a similar kind of potential. So it's a much more general idea. And I'm not going to try to go through all the mathematics again, but, but the basic, you know, so how do you build a, a, an approximation, you know, an outer expansion for anything? So what they do is if you have a bunch of particles in a box, let's say inside a sphere, then what they do is they put a, let me make it even easier, uh, they have it inside a little square. So what you do is you draw a circle around the square, and you put a bunch of particles evenly spaced around the circle. And you say, I want to choose the masses or the charges, whatever you want to call it, of all those evenly spaced points in the circle so that when I'm far away, it looks like the particles inside the box. So my approximation for anything is going to be a bunch of evenly spaced points on a circle. And I just have to assign them the correct masses or charges so that they behave, so they approximate everything inside. And all I need to do that is a subroutine that evaluates, you know, the, you know, the effect of one particle on one other. And it turns out they spend all their time in those expansions doing FFTs. So that's because I've chosen uniformly spaced points in a circle, not surprising, an FFT comes up. So they use FFTW and auto-tuners for that to, to make things go fast. So this is a much more general kind of approach than what I was doing before, which is gravity, and it's a good idea. So, um, so anyway, here are the other sort of lower level optimizations they did. So SIMD, as I told you about. So it turns out that you, since things get simpler as you get far away, sti you still need to know the distance, the R, the one over you know, square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. That still comes up in the approximation. And it turns out there's a special instruction, instruction on these processors which computes an approximate reciprocal square root using SIMD. So what it does, it will, it, it, if you give it an x, it'll give you 1 over the square root of x to 12 bits, so half precision. 
and it does that super fast. It's sort of built in because a lot of people want that function. And if you give it you know, a, a vector of four of those x's, it'll do all four of those approximate reciprocal square roots very fast. So if suppose you have uh, that to four, four 12 bits, and you want it to more closer to 24, one step of Newton's method, which is a multiply and an add, it's really cheap if you write down Newton's method for reciprocal square root, that will give you almost all you know, of the 24 bits correct that you need for single precision. It won't be correctly rounded, but who cares? I only want 12 bits correct, I mean, four digits at the, at the end of the day anyway. So that's another optimization they put in, and that made a big speed up. I'll show you the bar charts. Then there's different data structure reorganizations, you know, structure of array, array of structures. That affects what kind of, you know, regular old SIMD instructions you use. So they try them all in auto-tuning. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that sort of smells like matrix vector multiply inside the inner loop. And they reorganized it so it was more like a stencil operation, averaging with your nearest neighbors, and applied the kind of optimizations we talked about before. And then, since they spent a lot of time doing FFTs, they just used the FFTW auto-tuner, which we'll talk about in a later lecture to try to make it all run faster. And this was all sort of single node, parallel, so single multi-core chip, so it was all open MP. They didn't use MPI or anything. And the, and the other tuning parameter, finally, is how far down do you build your tree? When do you stop where, when you have Q particles in a box at the bottom? And that tells you for how many particles you're going to run the direct method, because you know, your nearest neighbors, you run the direct, direct method. And that's another tuning parameter. So you can imagine if you're on a GPU, which might be really good at doing the, you know, the direct method super fast, you'd have a bigger Q than for a, for a multi-core chip. So let me show you, so that's the tuning space. Now let me show you the results. So this is for just on the Nehalem. Let me just talk about one processor right now. And so this is single core, nothing parallel yet. And here are the one, two, three, four, seven phases of the algorithm. And so there's building the tree, and they're, all, and they're, much, they're more tree traversals because it's a more complicated algorithm. It's this kernel independent thing, and so you have to go up and down the tree more often. And so what does this mean? So here there are seven phases. Zero percent, that if, you, if zero percent is, means you're running at the unoptimized speed. So that's, that's, that's the starting point. And then the question is, how much faster do you go? 100% is twice as fast, 200% is three times as fast. That's the improvement. And if you go down, that's a slowdown, not a good thing. And it's color-coded by which optimization made the most difference. So the red bar said how, how important was using SIMD instructions. And so you can see that, you know, that got you maybe 80%, you know, close to 80%, so, you know, close to a factor of 2x, for example, on, on this particular data structure computation. So that's the SIMDization. The yellow bar was um, using that approximate reciprocal square root in one step of Newton. And it's amazing that, that the, it spends a lot of time computing one over the square root of r. So that's, that is all of those yellow bars. That's the speed up. Um, then going between structure of arrays, array of structures, transposing data structures was green. Um, using stencil optimizations gave you the purple. And then using FFTW, a really tuned matrix multiply, gave you that orange bar of improvement right there to comp compute all the expansions. So all of these were important things to do. So that's what the tuning space looked like for a single core optimization. Um, so let me tell you about, let me give you another slide which talks about another tuning parameter, which is how many particles do we have in each box when we get to the bottom of the tree. And so here is, um, so now, the horizontal axis is going to be the number of particles in the box when I get to the bottom of the tree. When do I stop you know, dividing my quad tree into four children or my oct tree into eight children? And the vertical axis is second, so down is good. And the blue is the initial unoptimized reference serial code before I put in all the optimizations in the last slide. And so when you have 50 particles per box, this is how fast it goes, about 200 seconds. When you get up to 100 particles per box, it goes down to 168, and then it gets a lot slower. If I take the optimized serial code from the last slide, you can see how much faster it runs. And now the optimum is more like 100 particles per box. And finally, if I do the optimized parallel code, which is way down here, and you know, my speed up, it's going from 168 seconds down to 10.4, you can see it's pretty flat. You can have like you know, hundreds and hundreds of particles per box, and that's the right thing to do. It's pretty insensitive since it's a pretty flat curve. OK, so now let me tell you what, compare all the different platforms. So I'm going to show you the results of all the optimizations on all the different platforms. 
And so there's going to be one vertical bar for an Ahalem, Barcelona, Victoria Falls, uh, a, um, a Xeon, a GPU, a single GPU connected to a Xeon, and two GPUs connected to a Xeon, all the different platforms. And this is going to be for a uniform distribution of particles. That's the easy case. And this is going to be for a non-uniform distribution of particles. They're all sitting on the surface of an ellipse. And so the way the, the axis works is that um, it's all normalized to the performance of the naive code on one Nehalem. That's one. So and, and so and so up is good. So that would mean I'm going 10 times faster than a naive code on a single processor in Nehalem, 100 times faster. And so let me look at Nehalem. It starts at one. I add in all the optimizations to do the sequential optimizations. I get to the top of the orange bar, and there's, I get a factor of eight from doing that. Then I parallelize it with OpenMP. That gets me up here to maybe a factor of 20. And then I say, well, what if I'm just going to evaluate the forces over and over again? Let me leave out all of the kind of overhead of building the quad tree and you know, traversing it and setting up the data structures. Let me just count the force part. Some applications that's relevant. It just depends on how often you rebuild the data structures. Then I get to the top of the green. So, if I j so that's where I amortize the tree construction. Just count the force evaluation. And the speed up maybe it's a little artificial, is a factor of 55. And there the speed up is 28. The, the Victoria Falls doesn't, you know, it starts off a lot slower, and it never gets very much faster than a single processor in a Halem. So on the GPUs, um, I'm not going to count the uh, building the tree at all because all the time is spent on the GPU. Uh, be, sorry. I'm not going to count the time of building the tree. That's done on the multi-core chip, the Xeon. The only thing the GPU computes is the force. So I'm just going to take the force evaluation on the GPU and compare it to the force eva <laughs> evaluation on one processor in a Halem. And I, on, on one GPU, it's 32 times faster. And on two, it's 60 times faster. So it's not quite a factor of two for two GPUs, but it's pretty close. And here's the same story, and it's pretty similar. In the non-uniform case, one GPU is running now 21 times faster, so it isn't as good a speed up because of the irregularity, but if I double the number of GPUs, it's 42 times faster. So it's getting a good speed up proportional to the number of GPUs. Okay. So uh, anyway, this is uh, the current state of the art to the best of my knowledge about doing n-body codes in parallel on, on, a, on a single node with multiple GPU platform. If you're doing it in an MPI world with many more processors then then, of course, you have to do all of those cost zones and things that I talked about before as well. So are there any questions about this? Because this is sort of the end of talking about hierarchical and body codes. Hierarchy means building these trees. So what I want to talk, yes. So uh, if uh, removing the tree construction over and over again actually speeds up the code, then why at all do that? So um, the question is, how often do you have to rebuild th uh, the tree? And, and so if, when the particles move, you need to re change something, right? And, and presumably you're going to move every step. And sometimes you have to uh, reevaluate all of the outer expansions because they've moved. Sometimes you also have to rebuild the tree because they've moved so much the load balance is bad. And so that is why both the green and, the, and all the other stuff is put here because one counts everything and the other one only counts it under the assumption that I'm not going to rebuild anything anymore. It, it depends on your application. So which speed up is more relevant to your application? Okay, uh, so it may so happen that on a different application, if you remove the, the tree construction uh, gamutization, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, th there won't be any speed up. There, there might actually be a, uh, it might run slower. Well, so, so let's, let's just look at a single Nehalem to make sure I understand your question. So if I, if I rebuild the tree and do everything over and over again at each step, I'm still getting a factor of 20 there which is a good thing, and if I'm not, but if I don't do that rebuilding of the tree every time, it's a factor of 54, mm. right? Either way, it's a good idea. I mean, mm. so, yes? So I believe on the previous slide, it showed that the parallel version was much more agnostic to the number of particles per box. Uh -huh. Can you dig into that a little more? I didn't quite understand why. So um, I'm going to... Let's see if I can speculate, because I didn't collect the data, and I'm not exactly sure. 
I think that uh, it's because the bottleneck in the code has moved to a place where it is not in the local computation, the number of particles per box, it's somewhere else. Um, be and so it doesn't really matter how many particles you have there. So why would that be? This is, this is just sort of live guessing. Um, since I'm running in parallel, the number of uh, local interactions is much smaller in the green line than in, than in the red or the blues. And so there are maybe, uh, it's a smaller fraction of the total time you spend doing the direct interaction. So maybe it doesn't really matter that much. But I'd have to look at the performance data in more detail you know, to, in, in, in the paper to answer your question. Any others? So, so these are, th that's a good question because it's, it's going to come up in your class projects too. And I will have some slides next time on sort of the kind of analyses I hope that people would do in their class projects, which is to not just draw performance plots like this, but try to interpret them and ask yourselves questions of the sort you just asked and, and try to answer them. Where is the bottleneck? Why are some parameters uh, more sensitive, you know, performance more sensitive to some parameters than others? So you know, be driven by the data, basically. You know, can you explain the data? So let me now uh, talk about a different aspect of the n-body algorithm and ask about minimizing communication. So, and there are going to be two uh, kinds of n-body codes I want to talk about. The first one is all the hierarchical ones I was just telling you about. And then there's the direct method. Which, is all, which is, certainly happens at the bottom of, of, in the leaves, but it's something that we understand much better so far. So a lot of the optimizations I told you about, uh, like locally essential trees, they were for the purpose of minimizing communication. I want to grab all the information I'm going to need over and over again from my neighbors, bring it to each processor once, and then reuse it. And we know that's a good idea. And so the question is, is there a lower bound that somebody could possibly prove about one of these algorithms? And I think people have thought about it, but right now I think it's still an open problem. And the reason is that there's um, just a lot of variables in this program to say what a correct algorithm is. For starters, we're not getting the right answer, right? The answer is an approximation. We're only settling for 1% or, or you know, four digits. And so it's hard to see how the, the lower bound is going to depend on how much accuracy you demand. So that makes it challenging. The lower bound may also depend on the particle distribution. And uh, you know, if all the particles are very clustered, it may have a different kind of lower bound than otherwise. And so let me just say this is an open problem. Um, if somebody wants to work on it for a class project, that would be uh, you know, a very challenging class project. So let me talk about direct methods. Because for direct methods, we pretty much know everything about the lower bounds and optimal algorithms for this problem. So let me tell you the theorem. Suppose we have pre P processors. And we want them to compute the interactions among n particles. And it doesn't have to be inverse square. Just every particle affects every other particle. And each processor has a local memory of size capital M. So this is sort of the same setup that we were having for our linear algebra world. And let's suppose it's load balanced so that each processor does an equal amount of work. So if there are n squared interactions, then each processor is going to do n squared over p interactions. So the question is, can I give you a lower bound on any algorithm that does this on, how, on the number of words communicated by each processor and the number of messages that have to be sent by each processor. And the answer is the number of words is just the number of interactions it does divided by its memory size. That's how much communication there has to be. And the number of messages is smaller by a factor of capital M. So, so if you remember the linear algebra world, it was very similar. The numerator was the number of flops. And the denominator was the local memory size, but to a different power, to m to the 1 half. Now it's m. Why is that? Well, let me put that off for a while. But the point is, it still looks the same. It's the number of flops, the number of loop iterations, divided by the memory size to some power. In this case, the power is 1. And then the number of messages is a factor of m smaller. And it turns out the theorem is true even if it's not all-to-all -all interactions. You can have any interactions you want, any subset. So, for example, you may have a cutoff distance. You're only, like in your homework assignment, you may only be interacting with particles within a certain distance. Or there could be some other rule about who you interact with. But however many interactions you do, that's what goes in the numerator. It's not n squared over p anymore. You just stick in the number of interactions you have. And it's still the same lower bound. And so the question is, when can this be attained? 
And so, and for which values of m can I attain it? Because, you know, m is a variable here. I mean, n is fixed by the problem, p is fixed by the machine, but I can use more or less memory. And if you remember in the linear algebra world, sometimes if I use more memory, I could go faster. So let's see what the story is here. And so let me tell you what the, uh, remind you perhaps from your homework, what a classical uh, n-body algorithm does. And we'll see that it attains the lower bound. So suppose that I have n particles on p processors and I want to compute all possible interactions. And so here I have eight processors and each little dot is a particle. And it's all evenly distributed to start with. And so here, let's suppose that I'm basically only going to have one copy of each particle, or maybe two copies. So the memory is n over p, or maybe 2n over p. And each processor is given those initial ones. So what's the algorithm? We talked about this a long time ago. It's very, very easy. Each processor takes a copy of all of its n over p particles and sends it to its neighbor. And then the neighbor computes all the interactions. And then you take that and you shift it to the next processor, compute all the interactions, shift it to the next processor. It's just the simple, you know, round, go around in a circle. And so, um, so that means that every subset of n over p particles gets shifted p times. And so uh, what is the cost? Let's figure it out. The computation is every, it's perfectly load balanced, n squared interactions done by p processors. What's the bandwidth cost? n over p shifted p times. n over p times p is n. And so that's the number of words shifted, and that equals the lower bound. Because the lower bound was the number of flops per processor divided by the memory size. So n squared over p divided by n over p, that equals n. So that naive, you know, totally natural algorithm hits the lower bound, assuming that I have this much memory. And what's the latency? The latency is, well, I had to send each chunk of particles p times, right? So the latency is p messages, and that also hits the lower bound. Because if I plug in n squared over p over m squared, it turns into p. So this, this all hits the lower bound. So the natural question is, can we do better? How can we do better than the lower bound when I have more memory available? This is the same thing that happened in linear algebra. If I could have multiple copies of my matrix, now I'm going to have multiple copies of my particles, and I'm going to go faster and, and hit the lower bound. So here, this is a communication avoiding version of the algorithm done by a team of people, including one of your GSIs in the front row. And we're going to call this, this algorithm is naturally called one-dimensional, because it's a one-dimensional array of processors. This one is going to be called one-and-a-half-dimensional, analogous to the two-and-a-half-dimensional matrix algorithm. <coughs> so let me assume that I have enough memory for C copies of all my data. So you know, two, four, eight, whatever number. And so let me assume that I can start all my particles off, and they're all stored not over all the processors. They're stored in P over C. So th this is P over C processors. And so how many particles per processor? It's N over P over C, which is you know, C times as much memory as I need. So now what I'm going to do, here now are all P processors. The first row is P over C. The next row is P over C. So I have C rows of P over C processors, P all together. And so what I'm going to do now is this processor is going to take, make a copy of all of its data in each row. So these particles are now going to be replicated there, there, and there. And these particles will be replicated there, there, and there. So now I, I've used all the memory in all the processors. And the question is, what's the algorithm going to do? And the algorithm will simply run the naive algorithm that I showed you before, but each row is going to do a disjoint subset of it. So each row is going to run one seeth of the naive algorithm. So let me show you how it works. So in the first step, I'm going to take every row is going to take its data that it stores and shift it to a neighbor. But how far do you shift it? This guy is going to shift it over by one, this guy is going to shift it by two, and this guy is going to shift it over by three. That'll make sure that everybody is doing kind of a disjoint subset of particle-particle interactions. So I've only drawn what the first column is doing. Every column is doing the same thing, shifting over by one, two, three. OK. So here's the main algorithm. I'm going, to t I'm going to take p over c squared steps. I'm going to compute all the pairwise interactions of everybody that I own, my personal particles and the ones that were just sent to me. And when I've done that, I'm going to shift it over a certain distance. And I'll compute those uh, interactions again. So the question is, and, and then when I'm done, each row will have, a, have computed a subset of the interactions. I will have, this guy will have the interactions of uh, all the particles that it owns with one quarter of the other particles. 
this guy will have the interactions with a different quarter of the other particles. So each row will have done an inter one quarter of the interactions. And of course I have to sum them up now because I, mean, I, I have four partial sums and their total sum gives me the answer. So the final thing I have to do is a reduction. So everybody in a column sums up all their forces into the first one and there I have the total sum. So I haven't written down all the algebra but that's the basic idea. So the question is, uh, how fast does this run? So it's, it's a perfectly you know, natural version of the usual algorithm. And so let me just uh, write down the steps. I've, I've um, left, mo most of the slide is the same. All I've done now is, is taken the algorithm and written down how much each step costs. So how much memory have I used? Every processor has C times as much memory as the, as the lower bound. So N over P is the least you can get away with. Everybody has C copies. So, um, and what the first thing I'm going to do is take all my copies and broadcast it down. That's a broadcast over C processors. That's log C. How much, what's the bandwidth? Everything is getting, I'm sending everything that I own, which is N times C over P. So that's the first step when everybody broadcasts down. Then the main algorithm is shifting sideways, shifting everything I own sideways. So doing that once, I'm sending one message to my neighbor. So the latency is one. And the bandwidth is everything I own, so nc over p. How many steps were there? p over c squared. And so all I do is take these two things and multiply them by 1 times p over c squared and this guy times p over c squared. And when I do that, I hit the lower bound. It all you know, hits the lower bound. I've used all the memory in an optimal fashion. And so this does attain the bandwidth and latency lower bound for any value of c, you know, one copy, two copies, three copies, but it sort of breaks when I hit the square root of p. So I, this is only going to work up to the square root of p. So let's see, let me draw the picture of my processors and see what funky thing happens when I hit the square root of c. So at that point, remember I have a p over c by c processor layout, now I have a square processor layout when c equals the square root of p. And so the algorithm becomes even simpler. I broadcast everything I own down, and then I do a single shift and do all the interactions, and then I go up. And so now the, uh, the, the bottleneck turns out to be not the main step. It turns out to be the broadcast and the reductions, the log C terms. Because the, the latency lower bound for the intermediate step, let me just look at it here. So P over C squared, what happens when C hits root P? This becomes 1. The lower bound hits 1. That's sort of a limit to this, to this stuff. And so it means that the algorithm has now latency 1. It's really log C and the bandwidth is n over root p. So this is the absolute lower bound, no matter how much memory you have, the bandwidth lower bound is going to be n over the square root of p. This algorithm was actually published a long time ago, in 1995, um, when, for this particular case when you have all, you know, is, is maximum amount of memory, and what's new is that you can use any amount of memory and still hit a lower bound. So let's see how much faster it goes. So here's some speed up plots. And this is a, a very extreme example. It's 32,000 processors on 8,000 cores. So four particles per processor. You'd think you'd be kind of overwhelmed by communication doing it that way. And indeed, the classical algorithm is overwhelmed by communication. So, so uh, the vertical axis is time, so down is good. And the horizontal axis is C, the number of copies that we make. So let me ignore the first column and just look at, I'll tell you about that in a moment. Let's talk about these columns. So if I have one copy of the data, the classical algorithm, then the green is how much time I spend communicating and the red is the arithmetic and you see it's totally dominated by communication. If I have two copies, it cuts down in exactly half the communication. The flops time stays the same. Four processors cuts down dramatically and by the time I hit you know, eight or 16, you can't even see the communication anymore. It's, it's totally dominated by those interacting of just a few processes. I mean, this is four particles per processor, right? This is not a lot. But it still spends all its time doing the arithmetic, and it's sort of a perfect, and it gives me a, a, like a 12x speed up by doing it this way. So, so this is a good idea. Um, so why do I have two values for C equals 1? This is done on a machine which has two different networks. And this is an IBM Blue Gene P. And so it has a traditional network where you can talk to your neighbors. It's a three-dimensional torus. And that is this green line here, and that's what all these algorithms use. But it has an additional special network that is just for reductions. It has a special extra network for doing, for doing tree reductions. 
And so, and that is what this algorithm is using. And so for this one, uh, you can go, you know, it goes a lot faster. They, have, they do not build this network anymore. The new version of this machine is IBM BGQ, and they've abandoned building this special network. You only get this one. So anyway, it's probably going to be even a, a better optimization in the future. So are there any questions about uh, NBody? Because what I want to do now is say how this generalizes. So we've, we've seen this sort of lower bound optimal algorithm we saw it for linear algebra. We've seen it for NBody. And now I want to say it applies to anything that looks like loops. And uh, there's sort of a general theory for that. So I just want to confirm. Uh, what we're talking about here with 1.5D stuff is accelerating the n squared inner loop. It's not accelerating the sort of order n uh, FM finite multiple stuff we're talking about. Right. right. This is only doing the direct interactions, and it works whether it's an n squared, everybody talks to everybody, or if there's a cutoff distance, it also works. And if you look at the, uh, the paper that's going to appear in IPDPS, uh, Michael can say more about this, they also get good speed ups when you only have cutoff distances. You're only interacting with the particles in a little ball around you. So it's, it's, it also, which is more, a better model of what happens at the bottom of the fast multiple method. You're just interacting with your nearest neighbors. But uh, this data was easier to explain. <laughs> okay. So the, the next, as I said, I claim that all of the, the so we've seen two examples now, in body, uh, everybody interacting with everybody, and there's lower bounds and algorithms that attain it, and the same thing for linear algebra. So the question is, how, how much do these generalize? So let me just go back and remind you about the linear algebra case so I can sort of say how they're similar. So here's the naive code for matrix multiply, which you saw, we've seen many times, three nested loops, i, j, k. And there's the block code that, we, uh, that we've seen before. So I'm going to have three outer loops and three inner loops. And the inside loop is going to do a b by b matrix multiply. So this represents a b by b matrix multiply. And as we know from the earlier lectures, there's a, a good choice for the value of b. What we do is we pick b to be roughly the square root of the cache size. So that's a b, each of these three b by b matrices fits in cache, and I use up all my cache. Let me ignore constant factors like three here. And the number of words moved turns into n cubed divided by the square root of the cache size. And so the question is, where do all these one halves come from? And there's sort of a general theory that works for not just for matrix multiply, but for anything that tell me all these constants. It tells me that what the exponent there should be in the block size, and it tells me what the exponent should be there in the lower bound. So let me just restate this theorem in, in its generality. So, and, and so let me just illustrate the theorem applied to matrix multiply before I try to state the theorem in its grand generality. So my starting point is these three nested loops, and all I need to know about this algorithm to figure out how to optimize it is stored in this little uh, three by three matrix. There's one column for every loop index, i, j, k, i, j, k. There's one row for every uh, array that's indexed in the inner loop, so a, b, c, a, b, c. I don't care if I'm doing multiplies or adds or whatever. And then I just keep track of which array has which subscripts. So a is subscripted by i and k, so I have a one there, a one there, but it's not subscripted by j, so I have a zero there. And then everybody else is the same. So everything I need to know is buried inside this very simple 0, 1 matrix. So then the theory goes on to say, I'm going to write down a linear program, an LP, and I'm going to solve it for a bunch of values of x. So what's the LP? Please minimize, excuse me, please maximize the sum of these three x's subject to the constraint that this matrix times x is less than or equal to 1. Each component is less than or equal to 1. This is a simple 3 by 3 linear program. And the result, we shouldn't be surprised, is 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. You can plug that in, and if I you know, take this matrix and multiply it by 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, I get 1, 1, 1. And it actually maximizes the sum of all these, and the answer is 3 halves. OK, so what does the theorem say? The theorem says that no matter how you organize, reorganize this matrix multiply algorithm, the number of words moved is the number of floating point operations, n cubed, divided by your cache size, to this magic number, minus 1. That's the general situation. And so 3 halves minus 1 is 1 half. So this is th this very general theorem that applies to any loops applied to matrix multiply. I'm going to write down a little linear program, and it's going to, an out is going to pop by solving the linear program, the magical exponent. 
It also tells me how to, how to, how to attain it. So see those one half, one half, one half? I'm going to use those as my block sizes. So m to the one half, m to the one half, m to the one half. And that tells me how to optimize it. So why is that true? I'm not going to say that yet. I just want to give two more examples to, to sort of illustrate what the theorem says. So now let me do it for n-body. So here is my you know, cartoon of the simplest way you could write down the n-body code. I'm going to loop over all pairs of processors. So i and j are both going from 1 to n. And I have an array of particle positions, pi and pj. I mean, they could have masses in it too, but it's basically an array. And I compute some function for every pair, and I add it to the force on particle i. So all I need to know about that algorithm in order to say what's its op optimality is stored in this little 0, 1 matrix. It's the same as before. There's one column for every loop index, ij, ij. And there's one row for every array that I reference. So f, and there's a reference p sub i, and there's a reference p sub j. They're different. And so f is only subscripted by i, so there's a 1 and there's a 0. p sub j is only subscripted by j, so there's a 0 and there's a 1. So everything I need to know is stored there. So what I'm going to do is, just as before, I'm going to solve a linear program. It's the same linear program. Please maximize the sum of these two x's, subject to the constraint that that matrix times x is less than or equal to 1. And the result is 1, 1, right? You add these two columns, you get 1, 1, 1. And the sum is 2. And the theorem tells me that the number of words move, no matter how I reorganize the n-body algorithm, is, m to the is the number of flops divided by m to the power, that magic exponent, minus 1, which is m to the 1. That's what I had before. And it's attained by these block sizes. m to the 1, m to the 1. So I read in m rows of p, I read in m particles, m particles, and I compute all m squared interactions, and, and I do the updates. And that's optimal. So now, let me pick a weird program, just to show you how general it all is. So I've written down a random program, and I want to apply the theory to it. So I'll have six nested loops, i1, i2, i3, i4, up to i6. And I have a whole bunch of arrays. I just sort of made this up at random. So a1 is indexed by i1, i3, i6, and a2 is indexed by i1, i2, i4, whatever you want. And all I need to know about that, I see my typesetting screwed up, is stored in the 0, 1 matrix. So there's one column for each of the six loop indices, i1 through i6. There's one row for every array reference. And all I need to record is which array has which subscripts. That's all I need to know to optimize this thing. And the theory says, write down a linear program. It's the same linear program as before, except now I'd say I have six variables in my linear program. Sorry, seven. Uh, x1 through x7, because I have these seven array references. And I'm going to multiply a times x is less than or equal to, uh, my linear program is the same. Delta times x is less than or equal to one. Please maximize the sum of the x's. And here are the answers. All these weird things, you know, two sevens, three sevens, blah, blah, blah. And uh, this should be x6. Sorry, there are, uh, there are only six entries. And the sum of them is 15 sevens. And so the theorem says that no matter how I organize these, this weird set of loops, that the number of words moved is going to be the number of inner loop iterations, which is n to the sixth, because it's, you know, that's how big it is. I1 goes from 1 to n. I6 goes from 1 to n. So n to the 6 loop iterations divided by the power m to the magic number minus 1, m to the 8 sevenths. This is not a practical code. This, the whole point of this sort of cartoon is to say this theory is pretty general. And how do I attain the optimal code? I just use these numbers as the block sizes. So I1 will have a block size of m to the 2 sevenths. I2 will have a block size of m to the 3 sevenths. I3 will have a block size of m to the 1 seventh. It just falls out of the linear program. So this is uh, the total, you know, this, this does, works for general codes. Now, the question is, can I attain it? I said I could attain it with these block sizes, but let me, let me be, a, you know, let me now tell you how this generalizes. Okay. So, so here's matrix multiply. And so all I need to state my theorem, all I need to know about it, is that I'm iterating over a three-dimensional set of indices, i, j, and k, some subset of triples of integers. And all I need to know is I'm accessing locations where the subscripts are i, j, i, k, and k, j. That's all I need to do. And so what is the general case? I can have an arbitrary number of loop indices, you know, i1, i2, i, k. They don't have to be from 1 to n. You know, they can be, you know, arbitrary kind of subsets. So i, k can go from i3 to i4. And my subscripts 
can be any linear functions that I want. I could have i2 plus 3 times i4. You can write down any mess you want. It works. And I can even have pointers. So I can have, so for example, I could take, you know, 3 times i4 and then have a pointer to memory as long as it gives me a unique memory location. All the theory works. And, and I could have, you know, as many lines of code as I want, right? It doesn't all have to be one line of code. And so how am I going to abstract that? So I'm going to say that, well, here I have k loop indices. So I'm going to be iterating over some set of z sub k. I just have to know that I have k, you know, k indices. And all I have to do is remember these linear functions. I'm going to take, I'm just going to extract out these linear functions, you know, so phi sub c tells me the subscript here is i1 plus 2i3 minus i7. Just have a list of all these linear projections. So that's all I need to know. Ni a nice, simple list of linear, li uh, linear projections. So now, let me say what the theory, uh, how, where the lower bound comes from. And it's going to be um, based on, here's the linear program. And if you've had a class in functional analysis or group theory, that's sort of what's necessary to understand the background. I'm not going to try to, to do all that. It's called the holder brass camp leap linear program. And uh, it's, yeah, so let me just state it. It says, I'm going to solve a linear program for a whole bunch of values. And what is the linear program? The linear program says that these have to satisfy some linear constraints. And so some number is going to be less than or equal to some linear combination times these guys. This is a set of linear constraints on these, on these numbers. And the linear constraints happen to be all subgroups of zk. So if you've had group theory, you know what I mean. And if you haven't had group theory, don't worry about it. This is just a large number of linear constraints. And so what is, suppose I do that. Then given any program with... Um, the array references that I had in the previous slide, let me solve this linear program. Let me choose these, all these values of s to minimize their sum subject to the set of linear constraints. That's a linear program. Then the number of words moved is lower bounded by the number of iterations in the inner loop. It doesn't have to be n cubed. It could be you know, sparse or whatever you like. Divided by the fast, matrix, uh, the fast memory size, the cache size m, to the power this magic answer of my linear program, minus 1. And the subscript HBL is just short for Holder Brass Camp Leap, who are the mathematicians who kind of you know, inspired all this stuff. And so I'm not going to try to prove this, but this is what you need to be able to write down the theory for, for the general case. And the proof depends on a recent result in rather pure mathematics by colleagues here, um, uh, Michael Christ at Berkeley, Terry Tao at UCLA, uh, and some other folks uh, in, in England. Okay. So this uh, says that if we can somehow manage to write down you know, this linear program and solve it, then we can, in fact, you know, get lower bounds for any algorithm that satisfies these constraints. So the natural question, and I'm not going to say any more detail about that. So the question is, is the bound attainable? So do we have an optimal algorithm that actually hits the lower bound? And it's obviously going to depend on the loop dependencies, right? If, if my algorithm has, where we're, if, one, if the iteration of one loop depends on the previous ones, I may not have the freedom to reorder them very much. It's easy, you know, I could easily write down something other than matrix multiply where each value depended on the previous one. I would have no freedom to change the algorithm at all, and I couldn't attain it. So let me assume that it looks like matrix multiply, which means that all I'm doing is I'm adding up a bunch of stuff or multiplying a bunch of stuff. It's associative, so I can reorder it any way I like. In that case, there's, let me tell you what we know. When can you actually write down an optimal algorithm? In the special case, which includes matrix multiply and n-body, when all of your subscripts are just a subset of the loop indices, like i, j, or you know, i, j, k, any, anything you want, just I can't add them or whatever, then it turns out that if you take that linear program I had in the previous slide and solve its dual, dual linear programming, it's, it's, it's a known idea in linear programming, the solution of the dual linear program gives me the block sizes. It gives me all of those exponents that I need to know. And that was the linear program I showed you before that I wrote down with that delta matrix. And so, for example, I got 1 half, 1 half, 1 half for matrix multiply. And it told me that I should block matrix multiply with m to the 1 half. And so this is a, a very general kind of theory. We're, we're, it's, uh, I'm hoping to actually get the paper posted by the end of spring break, but we'll see if we actually get that far. Um, so what is the ongoing work in this business? So we would like to compute the lower bound. I, I expressed it in this very abstract way, 
was saying, you know, here's, you know, for all groups and so forth, subgroups of, of ZK. When we first wrote it down, we thought that we had reduced it to a, a famous open problem, which is Hilbert's 10th problem over the rationals. Nobody even knows if it's decidable. But since then, we figured out that we believe it's a decidable problem to actually write down the lower bound in general. So we're getting that written up. Um, and we would also basically like to go far enough to put all of this into compilers. That would be a very ambitious project. So a user writes an arbitrary program. The compiler can say, does it look like nested loops? Does it have you know, loop indices which satisfy my rules? Gen automatically generate the linear program, write down the lower bound, generate the optimal code, and just that happens for you automatically. So now that we have this general theory, this is sort of a much longer term project to make this generally available, but that's what we're hoping to do. So what I could do, I have a few minutes left. So what I'd like to do now is go back and just prove this theorem that I just showed you in a very special case where we can see it all in just three dimensions. Just do the matrix multiply case without doing the general case. Because then it just, I can appeal to your intuition in a much more reasonable way. So I'm going to prove everything just for matrix multiply. Things that smell like three nested loops. And I'm going to use a proof that was just in the special case of matrix multiply before this big generalization that goes back to 2004. So here's the idea of how I prove my lower bound. So I'm going to be thinking of you know, my program for doing matrix multiply is just a sequence of instructions. It's going to do loads and stores and multiplies and adds. Th that's what a program is. And so each load and store is going to move a word between fast and slow memory. I want to count how many loads and stores my program has to do. Each one of those is, a, is, a, is moving a word of memory. And so what, what do I have? I'm going to do the usual n cubed multiplies that, that, in the three nested loops of n by n matrix multiply. And I can reorder them any way I want. And I'm going to assume that I have a cache of size capital M. And I want to count you know, how many moves have to her. So here is the four-step process. I'm going to take my sequence of instructions. I'm just going to look at the multiplies, the adds, the loads, and the stores. And I'm going to break it up into, into steps. I'm going to count how many loads and stores I have. And as soon as I get to uh, M, I'm going to say that's a segment. So the first segment of instructions is going to have exactly M loads and stores in it. And then I'm going to start counting again, and I'm going to count the second segment. It's going to have exactly m loads and stores in it. So I'm just going to break my whole instruction stream in, into chunks. Each chunk will have exactly m loads and stores, move m data, and it'll do some number of, of multiplies and adds. So let's suppose that I could magically say, how many useful multiplies can I do, assuming I've done m loads and stores? Let's suppose I can bound the number of multiplies in each of those segments. So I know how much each segment costs, m loads and stores. So how many segments are there? So I want to, if I can count the number of segments, multiply it by m, that is my cost of, of moving memory. So let's suppose I can bound the number of flops that can be done in each segment. Then the number of flops times the number of segments is going to be the total number of flops. Right? If each segment can do at most f floating point operations, then the number of segments, the total number of operations the whole program does is f times the number of segments, and that's going to be n cubed, 2n cubed. So just doing division, th then the number of segments is going to be bounded below by the total number of flops divided by the most number of flops I can do per segment. If I know a lower bound of the number of segments, I'm, and I multiply that by m, that gives me a lower bound of the number of loads and stores, because each segment does exactly m loads and stores. So here's a very simple formula. m times n cubed divided by how many f useful flops can I do when I've, uh, in one segment. And all I know about a segment is it's done m loads and stores. So it's sort of like asking ourselves, I have m useful pieces of information. How many multiplies can I do? So now I finally get to the, to the lower bound. What I'm going to do is I'm going to model my three nested loops, i, j, and k, as a three-dimensional box. So I'm going to have an i, a j, and a k index. And so each one of these boxes is going to be indexed by i, j, and k. That represents a multiplication. So because each, each inner loop is indexed by i, j, and k. So, so each of these, the faces, each face of this box is going to be indexed by i and k. That's going to tell me a, because a, a is subscripted by i, comma, k. So this little square, that's going to represent a11. That square is going to represent a12. 
A13, this is going to be the B face, because B is indexed by J and K, and so that's, you know, JK equals 1, 1, that's B11, that face is B12. And then the top of the box, that's indexed by I and J, that's the C matrix. So the, this face represents, you know, C11, you know, C22, and so forth. And then each of these cubes represents a multiply. So this cube says, you are multiplying A13 times B31, and you're adding the result into C11. So each cube rep represents a multiply. Each face, so yeah, so this cube represents that multiply, and each face represents uh, a, a, you know, the data that it needs. So in order to do that multiply represented by that cube, I need three words of memory. The red one, the blue one, and the black one, okay? So what I need to, so here's the idea. What can I do in one segment? Well, in one segment, how many A's, B's, and C's can I have? How many entries of those three matrices can I have? Well, in one segment, I can have M words that are sitting in cache already, and I can maybe read M more words, right? Because each segment, is count, I'm counting loads and stores. So I can, I can start with a, M words of A in fast memory, and I can read M more. So I can have at most two M words of A in, in a segment. I can have at most two M words of B, and at most two M words of C. So that's my constraint. How many cubes can I have if the number of cube faces is bounded by 2m? So let me just sort of, and this just says in words what I just said. Okay, so let me just draw the ge geometric picture. So here is my box. Each little cube in the box is an ijk. It's a multiply. And so let me just try to count the number of multiplies in that little box. This, so this is a, made of a bunch of little cubes. And let me just suppose that it's uh, a, a, sort of this brick. It's a brick whose lengths are x cubes on that side, y on that side, and z on that side. So what data do I need to actually evaluate it? Well, I need all the entries of A that are on this projection. So I need x times z entries of A. I need that projection. I need this entry, all these entries of B. Blue, B is blue. I need z times y entries of B. And I need all the entries of C that are represented by this projection. Okay? So the number of cubes in the black box, the number of multiplies, that's the volume. It's x times y times z, obviously, because it's just a brick. And how do I, there's this funny way to write x times y times z. I can write it this way. And I can see that it's the number of a's times the number of b's times the number of c's. That gives me x squared times y squared times z squared. And I take the square root. So this is a funny way to represent the volume of a brick. You just take the area of the faces, multiply them, and take the square root. That works for a brick. For the lower bound, I need to have any shape here I want, no matter how I reorganize the algorithm it turns out I get the same, same result. So let's let this blob of, of, of stuff, this blob of collection of squares, be all the multiplies I do in a segment. What entries of A, B, and C do I need to do it? I need its, all the entries of A in its sort of A shadow, its projection onto the A face. I need all the entries of B from its uh, shadow in the B direction. And I need all its, the entries of C from its C shadow, its projection in the upper direction. So I want to bound how many flops can I do if I know the, this area, that area, and that area for any possible shape. And there's this classical theorem from 1949 in geometry which says that no matter what this is, the number of cubes in that set is bounded by the product of the areas. Take the square root. So here it's equal. It's easy to see. Here it's an inequality. That gives me my upper bound. So, so let me finish the proof. I'm going to consider one segment of instruction. It has m loads and stores. That means that I can have at most two m entries of a, b, and c available. m because they were sitting there in cache already, and I can read at most m more. And so that tells me that the, these areas can't be bigger than 2m. So that means that the number of multiplies I can do in one segment is 2m, number of a's, 2m, number of b's, 2m, number of c's, multiply them together and take the square root. So it's m to the 3 halves. So m to the 3 halves is a bound on how much useful work I can do with order m data for matrix multiply. So that tells me the number of segments, since I have to do 2n cubed floating point operations, is at least 2n cubed over that. And so the number of loads and stores is m times the number of segments. It's m times 2n cubed over f. And that's bounded below by m times n cubed over m to the 3 halves. And I get a cancellation, and I get m to the 1 half in the denominator. So that's what works for matrix multiply. And the point is that this picture 
it has now been generalized to kind of arbitrary projections and arbitrary directions. So I don't have to just, you know, bound it with these projections and these orthogonal ways. It works for any loops. And that's where the theory comes from. And so uh, this is a good place to stop. Are there any questions? This was meant to be a very high-level tour of something that takes you know, quite a few pages to explain in detail. Next time, we'll talk about the structured grid uh, motif. <laughs>